stories, I don't only mean these big political successes like hunting of turtle dove was banned from France last year. I also mean these small moments. Uh, for example, if you take a small bird out of a net in Brescia and just let it fly and then you just watch it. You know? Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I talked to Axel Hirschfeld about the loss of ospreys to hunting, what markets are driving the killing of other migratory birds from the skylark to the vulture, and the technological race between bird poachers and those trying to stop them. So on the flight of the Osprey expedition, we have uh, made it to the south of Spain. And right at this moment, it's early September, migration has really started to kick in in full swing. And at this moment, we felt it was a perfect time to speak to Axel Hirschfeld from uh, CABS who has been working uh, along with CABS to, um, for the protection of migratory birds, um, but at the, at really at the, at the front, on the front line is what I'd say. Um, Axel, to start with, could you tell us if there was a particular moment uh, in your life which you think has steered you towards this path of working for migratory birds? Because it's well, a challenging field to be in. Yes, it is. Well, it was not a particular moment rather than a particular person um, yeah, no, who introduced me into all this uh, bird stuff. It was uh, an old man I met, uh, I met in the forest close to my hometown when I went back from school. And yeah, he was the one, you know, um, you know, borrowing his binoculars to me and he was taking me out and for for um yeah um, for my first um, ringing experience, bird ringing experience, I'm a bird ringer till today. And I think this um, was when I was around 15, 16, when I got dragged into all this bird stuff. Right. Um, okay. And so, uh, as we were, as I mentioned earlier, migration has really started. And also the hunting season in certain places also started. So whilst we're right at the beginning of a season now, you've already had to spring into action. Um, and uh, in a couple of cases, can you explain what they are? Yes, at the moment, CAPS is conducting anti-poaching operations in, I think, more than seven European countries. And um, these operations already started in August when the first migrants started to migrate. So, for example, in, um, in the north of Italy, our teams already managed to catch seven poachers in cooperation with the Carabinieri Forestale, which is the forest police there. Um, we are at the moment preparing operation in Valencia and Andalusia in Spain, in Malta, ask, Cyprus and Lebanon. Can I ask in, in Italy, what were, the, what were the poachers catching and why? They were poach, uh, they were catching um, little songbirds, in this case fly catchers, pipe fly catchers and tree pipits. And um, they trapped them because they, uh, you know, they are... Um, um, a very high price delicacy so they eat them so this tiny just to think of the practicalities we're talking really tiny little birds with not very much meat on them yes. um and they actually they they fetch a high price uh, as opposed to being something that those those poaching want to eat for themselves yeah this is a million euro business not only in italy but also in other countries such as cyprus and um, yeah, they, 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 those birds are also being sold to, to restaurants and we still find restaurants also in Italy, which have, for example, um, skylarks, uh, thrushes or other songbirds on the menu. It is illegal. And if we find a restaurant which is doing this, of course, they will be reported to the police. Mm. I mean, I've had uh, on paragliding trips in the south of Spain, I've had I've been offered a bowl of mixed small birds. 
uh, to which I've asked what small birds are there and they haven't been able to give me an answer and I guess that's probably why there's they're not they shouldn't actually be on the menu at all Absolutely. But, um, you know, if you are talking about this subject, you have to clearly differentiate between songbirds, which are allowed to be killed by hunters. It's uh, This is the case. So we have a lot of European countries, including Italy, Malta and Cyprus, who allow the shooting of um, certain songbird species, for example, skylark. In Germany, it's a species of conservation concern, but uh, in Italy, it's on the list of huntable species. So is uh, the thrush. Um, and also in France, many songbirds are still allowed to hunt. Uh, uh, France, French government is still allowing their hunters to hunt a lot of songbirds. On the other hand, you have poaching, and this is mainly for birds which are, of course, not officially huntable. This mainly affects, you know, as I told you, small uh, birds like uh, flycatchers and pipits and robins in Italy, as well as uh, blackcaps in Cyprus, for example. So um, on the one hand, we are, um, you know, politically campaigning that these states, which are yeah. still allowing this practice, um, are banning it. And on the other hand, we are helping the enforcement bodies of these states to, uh, to enforce the law, which is already there. Um, mainly on paper, but this, you know, this is the problem. The laws are there, but as long as they are not being enforced, um, yeah, the poachers have not, not a big risk of getting caught. And so uh, is the majority of CAB's work based around hunting, hunting of different species, predominantly on migration? Yeah, I would, I would not even say hunting if you include trapping in that. So it's mainly about tra trapping and, of course, also hunting. So CAPS is a very specialized organization. So we are not doing the, the, the usual bird protection activities such as, you know, uh, um, you know, planting trees, building nest boxes and all this stuff, or, you know, caring for, for, for sanctuaries, which uh, we have a sanctuary in northern Germany, but this is not our, you know, let's say flagship project. So we are yeah, pretty much specialized in combating bird crime in, in Europe. And bird crime, I say, illegal trapping, illegal shooting, illegal poisoning. It's, it's a problem, for example, here in Germany. So this is what we mainly do. And this is what we are good at. And have you ever come across uh, issues of the osprey being trapped or killed? Yeah, so ospreys, um, I remember a case uh, a couple of years ago when we received a shot osprey, which has been um, shot down on the island of Malta and by poachers. And at these times, uh, there was no proper rehab center on Malta, so they sent this bird to Germany. Unfortunately, also our vets were not able to save that bird, but uh, yeah, it was and um, it will not be the first osprey. Ospreys, uh, which is uh, which has been killed on Malta. Ospreys actually are getting shot in Malta on a on a regular basis. Yeah. And and what? So that that bird you knew was a German bird because it had a ring on it. Is that right? That's right. It has a had a ring on it, and so we could trace it to to um, to the north of Germany. Um, yeah, and yeah, so we know the life history of the bird. And do you know why why somebody would have shot an osprey? Surely they're not being eaten, and there's not enough of them to be. No, no, they are, um, no, no, um, ospreys, I think somebody who is shooting an osprey does not want to eat it. In Malta, um, the, the, they, don't, they don't eat the, the birds. They don't eat the big birds they shoot down. In Malta, you have approximately 5,000 reasons in terms of 5,000 euros. This is, I think, the price such uh, an osprey, a stuffed specimen can fetch on the black market there. And this is why they shoot them. They want to make money with it. And the market for a stuffed osprey is in Malta or it's elsewhere? Um, it's mainly on Malta because in Malta you have um, many, many collectors who have, yeah, um, you know, in, 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 in the homes, in their cellars, they have huge collection of, uh, of stuffed birds. And they, some of them, as far as I have been informed, they don't collect species. They also collect color variations. So they have, for example, like say honey buzzards in 10 different color shapes, you know. So this is... Yeah, it's, it's a hobby on Malta, and uh, there was a publication from the Malta government um, recently which says that the estimation is that there, is, there are more than 500,000, you know, stuffed protected birds in Maltese um, yeah, mm -hmm. collections at the moment. And um, yeah, this is more than, than the population of Malta. Huh? So this shows the dimension on Malta alone. And I could imagine as ospreys are a species which 
I think is, I think nobody has ever bred an Australian captivity, I would say. So this is not a, a possible source to get legal birds. So I would say, especially Ospreys could also go abroad to collectors. There are collectors in other countries. Wow. I'd never even considered that as a the the stuff to, the stuff to trade as being an important one. Um, it, you, what was that? it is it is important. Um, also here in Germany, we have I think at the moment three ongoing large cases again taxidermists from Bavaria in the south of Germany, and um, so they are not dealing with ospreys, but you know it's uh, it's taxidermy and it's it's about illegal. Uh, sale of protected bird species as stuffed specimens so it's a problem in every country of Europe. And you you mentioned uh, briefly that you have also been active recently in Spain. Mm -hmm. no. going through. Can you yeah, tell no, us what's happening there? Yeah Spain is one of the countries where we started um, our operations I think 10 years ago. This is mainly against the illegal trapping of small songbirds there. So they use actually two methods there. Uh, one is the so-called um, silvestrismo, that's the, the, the Spanish word for it. So this is mainly using nets, um, clap nets for the trap of certain species of finches, like the goldfinch, chef finch, uh, and these birds, which are being trapped on migration. And um, also in the winter time, because winter time, because some of these birds are also wintering in Spain. And the other method is um, lime stick prepping. These are large lime stick installations, which they call parani. And um, yeah, um, the, the most of the birds are being lured down to these installations with the help of electronic bird callers. These are, um, yeah, I think it, they used to be real cassettes, which they played nowadays. It's, you know, MP3 players equipped with loudspeakers and uh, digital timers which lure down the birds during the night. Because as you know, most of small bird migration happens in the night. The osprey migrates during the day. And in that, in that occasion, was it the, the methods that were illegal or the birds they were catching illegal? Everything. Everything. <laughs> so the, the lime stick installations, the parami, they used to be legal. Um, so it was a tradition um, um, in certain areas of, uh, of Spain, but this was one of uh, the big success stories in the last years that we were able, and together with our uh, Spanish partner organizations, to convince the Spanish government to, um, to abide by European law and uh, to ban this practice, which they labeled as, um, you know, as traditional old hunting methods, which should be preserved. But um, you know, at the end of the day, with the pressure from the NGOs and with the pressure from Brussels, from the European Commission, this has now been banned. And we are now dealing with you know, what is left. So some of them, of course, are still doing it. Now they are poachers. And um, yeah, but I think um, overall, especially the trapping with the lime sticks has massively decreased in the last year. So this is a big success story. And in in that occasion, did I read correctly that it was you had there was about two hundred wild caught birds at a at a site? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes um, um, you know, and if there is you know, it's, it's, especially most of these sites, they are not somewhere in the landscape. Some of them are strategic, strategically placed in um, on routes or on bottlenecks where masses of birds where, 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 where you have a enorm densification of bird migration. So. Um, on good days, and especially if you are using illegal methods like these electronic bird luring machines, you can catch hundreds of birds. Uh, we have found trapping installations in Italy, which are especially on Cyprus, which, um, you know, we, here we are speaking of several hundreds of meters of trapping nets, which are being operated by at least five or six people who control these nets, you know, every hour in the morning. So these installations can catch up in good migration days, I think a four figure number of birds easily. Wow. So one's kind of small operation could actually be wiping out a vast number of birds. Yes, of course. And especially, you know, um, if, if we are talking about species of conservation concern, these uh, traps, they don't make any difference if a species is at the brink of extinction or still very common. 
And that's why the European Union and uh, has banned bird trapping um, um, because it is not selective. And um, yeah, that's also in, uh, yeah, written down in the European Birds Directive, which is our main tool if mm -hmm. we are operating in European countries. And um, of course, we are not only chasing uh, the poachers and trying to report them to the police. We are also putting pressure on the local governments to adopt their laws um, so they fulfill the requirements of the birds directive and also to, to enforce these laws. This is probably the main problem. Most of the laws are only on paper and nobody goes out and is monitoring the situation in the field. And have you come across examples where the poachers are actually just poaching for food for like their personal survival? Is that a thing or is it pretty much always for money? Now, of course, we have poachers like um, some in this case where an old man like 70, 80 plus is catching some birds in his garden. And probably if you see how much traps he is using, like five or six bow traps or something like that, this is not a big fish. So you can assume that this guy is only um, catching the birds for his own um, cooking pot. But um, on the other hand, we have loads of really very, very large trapping installations. They some some of them are have CCTV surveillance or people um you know are guarding it day and night. So uh, and these are the people who are causing most of the damage. Mm. And and overall, do you feel like we're going in a positive trajectory? <coughs> these things. Um, positive things, yeah, of course. Um, we have um, countries where. Um, things are really developing very positively and we have other countries where uh, we still have a very long road to go. A um, good positive example would be, for example, Italy, where um, we have established a very, very good working relationship with the, with the police and where our teams um, you know, are catching at least, I would say, between 80 and 90 poachers every year and all of those cases go to court. And, wow. and we can measure um, our success uh, because we are counting the number of traps our teams are finding. We are counting the numbers of birds in these traps. We are counting um, the number of cases. So we can tell you that in Italy, in our operational areas, especially in the north of Italy, yeah, compared to 25 years ago when we started, so we are now dealing with, let's say, between 5 and 10% and of what was there. So this is this is a huge development. Other countries such as Cyprus and Lebanon, you know, we are just beginning, and um, yeah, there I think we will still need some years to to come to similar results. Can you mention the example of uh, of vultures in Lebanon? Yes, um, vultures are among the species which are uh, migrating over Lebanon and which are also being targeted by hunters, especially in those areas where they have to cross um, the Lebanon mountain range um, yeah, very low, so they are in shooting range or close to the roosts where they, where they sleep. And is, is that a bit of a bottleneck or could they cross anywhere along that? Um, so normally you have certain areas, it, it's more a geographical thing, you know? So they, um, these, those large soaring birds, they avoid to go um, over the sea because there are no thermals, so they can't fly. So mm -hmm. they need some land. Um, and in Lebanon, if you see Lebanon on a map, the whole coast is one big concrete jungle. So it's also so they uh, in Lebanon they they, they mainly use uh, a corridor as one of the corridors which is being used by Lebanon is you know so over the western slopes of the Lebanon Ridge, and yeah, uh, and there they shoot these uh, you know. Uh, raptors, honey buzzard, and also um, lesser spotted eagles, and also um, um, vultures. And last autumn, our teams managed to uh, trace um, and to find, I think at, in total, I think it was six Egyptian vultures, a uh, species of really conservation concern. There are not many left here in Europe. Mm. And one griffin vultures and uh, one griffin vultures in, uh, yeah, in, in in illegal captivity, one of them in a in a private zoo. And the case with the griffin vulture was that it was still bearing, uh, you know, um, in a Bulgarian ring. So this bird was being ringed in Bulgaria some years ago, 
as a wild bird and uh, on its first and it i think it was also equipped with a um, with a gps transmitter and <laughs> yeah and the bulgarians informed us that um, on its first migration this bird was lost somewhere between the border between syria and lebanon and uh, of course everybody thought this bird is dead and three years later we found it in a zoo in lebanon still wearing the ring from the bulgarian bird ringing scheme so this bird is also now uh, in our hands or in the rehab center um, how how would they? Uh, how do you catch a vulture on migration? Um, no, you don't. Normally, um, I, I think normally they don't catch them. So of course you can. I, I, there is a method where you can how you can trap vultures. I'm not going to describe it to you, but <laughs> you never know who is listening. But it has to do with snares. But I think most of the birds we found they have been X-rayed, and um, on the X-rays you can clearly see, uh, see that they had lots of lead pellets embedded in their bodies small lead pellets which are you know which are good to kill small birds and good enough to bring big birds down and um, not you know killing them so they can still be used or being sold as pets wow so just uh, just enough to maim them that they can't fly yes exactly it's brutal it is brutal but um yeah it's it's unfortunately it's our it's our it's our daily daily business the good story is that from um, three Egyptian vultures, which we rescued from a zoo in the south of Lebanon, at least one bird, um, after some month of intensive rehab, was able to be released in the south of um, Lebanon, close close to the border to, to Palestine. And the other two birds were being transported back to Europe, to Prague. And now they are in Prague Zoo, where they hopefully can contribute a little bit to the survival of their species in a captive breeding project. Great. Wow. Um, yeah, really interesting. The um, Can I ask, obviously you're, you're working at the front line, you're seeing, hearing, working in things which are quite brutal. Um, in all of that, you still seem to have a pretty optimistic air. Yes, yes, I do, because, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's not all bad things which we are experiences uh, experiencing. As I told you, um, there are a lot of lot of success stories, and with success story success stories, I don't only mean these big political successes like hunting of turtle dove was banned from France last year. I also mean these small moments. Uh, for example, if you take a small bird out of a net in Brescia and just let it fly and then you just watch it. You know, this is also something which is, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's giving, giving you back a lot. And this is also probably what not only me, but also most of our other volunteers are, is driving yeah, yeah to get birds in the air again. Back in the air. And you mentioned a couple of times the level of high tech that are now being incorporated within trapping schemes. Um, and I know, so for example, previously in, in fishing, you know, as fish numbers depleted, you keep, keep catching more and more and more by having more and more technology, being able to fish harder. Is Do you think that's an issue with uh, with trapping and hunting or is is that not the case? Is technology being able to keep up or increase no, levels? No, definitely. It is a very big issue. And um, all these, um, you know, um, electronic um bird lures i told you about you know they are you know high-end digital mp3 technique and you know we are uh, seizing this together with the police on a regular basis so we know how all these things are working and um, in malta we have learned that um, some of the trapping sites are actually being cctv surveillance have cctv surveillance we have um by by the police or by trappers no the trappers so the trappers oh. If, if our teams are coming and they can get rid of the evidence before the police is arriving, that's the only reason why they have the CCTV. And um, of course, they also want to protect the property. Um, anyway, um, this is one thing. Um, and of course, it's also a race of arms a little bit because also we as CAPS and as a conservation organization, organization are more and more using technology to, um, to get poachers to justice, for example, uh, we are using drones, we have um, sophisticated night vision devices, uh, some of the birds are being poached at night, so we uh, 
have night vision devices. And of course, we are um, yeah, using uh, spotting scopes, high range spotting scopes and video cameras, which help us uh, to, 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 to gather evidence and which would not be possible to gather, let's say 20 years ago with a normal, you know, um, camera, linear camera, non-digital camera. But, you know, it all worked also 20, 30 years ago. I remember when we first went into the mountains in, in Northern Italy, in Brescia, and we only had fax. And I remember when we had our four, first big mobile phone. So somebody had to carry it in a backpack. There was a backpack which was reserved only for this mobile phone. <laughs> <laughs> it was like two kilos or something like that. And if you see how easy it is today, also with Google Earth, Google Earth is helping us a lot. You know, in, in Spain, we, um, uh, you can see the tracking sites. You can find tracking sites by, uh, uh, with Google Earth. And also on Malta, if you go on the Maltese coastline, and if you zoom in, you will find hundreds and hundreds of uh, tracking sites, which you can see from space. Wow. Um, Axel, thank you very much. It's been really interesting, really inspiring to hear uh, all the work you're doing. And uh, yeah, uh, look forward to hearing more. Thank you very much. <laughs>